for the whole show. But enough of the technical language. I hope everything is going well for you. Uh, I guess things could go worse for me and they could go better. We have clips for you. Clips have we. We have a bunch of stuff from, I wonder if it'll get louder as I lean down towards the mic. We have things from show number four. Show number four was a Jesse Fuller show. Jesse Fuller was a wonderful guy. I saw him, I met him, I shook his hand, and he's gone now. Can't shake his hand no more. Unless, you were the Ghost Rider. Have you seen that movie with Nicolas Cage? He can reach inside a grave and talk to a dead person. He comes alive for a couple minutes, and then when he lets go of me, goes dead again. It's interesting. I mean, I wish it was a wonderful movie instead of just decent. To Fuller, the Lone Cat, known as the Lone Cat because he, he couldn't find anybody dependable enough and it drove him crazy. So he decided he would play himself and do it somehow as a one-man band. So he invented a foot-operated bass, which he called the foot della. And um, he played it different keys with his toes. It had, uh, he made the first one out of half a coffin. And um, he had a rack around his neck with a microphone and a harmonica and a kazoo. And he played electric 12 string. And uh, next to the uh, bass was a hi-hat or a stick that rubbed on a washboard. 
So he would have on the beat and off the beat, boom, ching, boom, ching, boom, ching. He's incredible. And uh, I saw him in the 1960s. He was terrific. He is most famous for doing San Francisco Bay Blues. I got the blues when my baby left me by the San Francisco Bay. He got $25 for that song, which has been recorded by hundreds of people. And uh, I'm not going to play that one tonight. I'm going to play you some of his other stuff. Uh, I really liked him in the 60s. He used to be on a label called Good Time Jazz. But uh, uh, his, a lot of his stuff is available on CD now. I have a really good one called Brother Lowdown. In his station wagon and sleep near the cemetery so he could sleep for free sleep in the station wagon by a cemetery. He told me at a club in the 60s. Uh, I was so impressed. Gosh, he was a great guy. Little guy. I read later that um, he snored incredibly loudly. <laughs> it's pretty funny to think about. But, um, <sighs> um, he had a great song on one of the albums I have, 99 Years in One Dark Day. I don't know the whole song, so I can't do it tonight, but he introduces it by saying, 99 years in one dark day. 99 years, that's when you get a life in prison. One dark day, that's when you die, and it's too bad for you. I'm gonna play You're No Good. You're No Good is, well, he called it Crazy About a Woman. Bob Dylan, on his first album, called it, You're No Good. Curry's about a woman, she lived in the neighborhood. She's the kind of woman, don't mean no man or girl. I'm gonna leave her like I found you when I first met you, lovely and baby. Nobody in the world could get along with you. Got the ways of a devil sleeping in a lion's den. I come home last night, you wouldn't let me go. Sometimes you're as good as anybody but I want you to be. Then you get a crazy notion, start running all over me. Well, you're getting mad to tell you always talking me around. The way you do make a preacher lay his Bible down. Shoes on your feet, pretty mama. I helped you while you had no food to eat. You're the kind of woman I don't understand. You're taking all my money, give it to another man. When you wake up in the morning, you always wake up like go right down to the corner. So I can get yourself a day Will you give me the blues? I hope you're satisfied You give me the blues Till I wanna lay down and die I read this week that Captain Salty His end of the world show Is coming to an end I have no idea if that has anything to do with the 21st of December, which some Mayan fellow 5,000 years ago predicted would be the end of the world. Of course, I don't want it to be the end of the world and probably neither does anybody else. I, I'm pretty sure it won't be the end of the world, but it would be a heck of a thing if it was. I don't want the world to end. I don't even want to die personally, but both are inevitable and unpredictable. I must say, LCA TV had their Christmas party last week. It was great. I got to meet and forget the names of 30 or so really nice people. I'm just so bad with names. I could never be a politician. 
well, what the heck, I could never be a number of things. But I'm good at whatever I am. You know, the cell phones have horrible microphones when you put the speakerphone on. It uses a different microphone, I guess, and it's not as good. The weirdest thing about cell phones and the exact reason why people talk too loudly on their cell phones is that regular phones, your microphone, your voice is piped in through the speaker in your ear along with the person you're talking to. So you hear their voice and you hear your voice in your ear. You can judge your volume. With a cell phone, you cannot hear how loud you're talking. And that's why people talk too loud on cell phones. I've never heard anybody mention noticing this. Do a lot of people know this? Am I the only person to notice this? Soon, I hope to take you, which is to say the camera, out into the world. It couldn't possibly involve more editing than I've gotten myself into now, combining show three and four with show 102 and 103, because it's all very different. The lighting is different. The sound is different. It's different. And I have to make it mm, contiguous? I don't know. My vocabulary seems extraneous now that people don't talk like that anymore. But of course, if you read old books, you have to learn many words that are not commonly used anymore. In some cases, not at all anymore. Henry James, Mark Twain. Why do I cite them? Henry James, uh, I find Henry James pretty difficult to read. And so did Mark Twain. Uh, he just didn't like him much. Henry James put out a new book and some reporters asked Mark Twain, how do you like Henry James's new book? And Mark Twain said, once you put it down, you can't pick it up. This is great. It's kind of like a coin. I have an album called Once a Rounder, which was made with a side view like this, drawn by a wonderful artist, Ginny Joyner, uh, for my album cover. And she put me on a coin. It's great. It's like, I think it's a penny. Um, and it's my profile, of course, smiling in a way that presidents do not smile on coins. I guess they think it would look foolish. I think many people feel that smiling is uncool and especially smiling at a stranger. Um, it's more, I guess, how can I explain everything in one show? I can't just be full of one more song. Uh, I, I play this the most, actually. I play this whenever I see kids in the audience, the monkey and the engineer. Once upon a time there was an engineer who rode a locomotive both far and near. Accompanied by a monkey who would sit on a stool Watching everything that the engineer do One day he went to get a bite to eat he Left the monkey sitting on the driver's seat The monkey pulled the throttle, locomotive jumped the gun And made him 90 miles an hour down the main line around Big 
having seen The Who in person several times. I saw The Who for the first time at the Murray the K Summer Spectacular Show, which happened to take place at a theater within walking distance of Sheep Meadow in Central Park, where the first BN was held. I remember walking over from the park to the show. I believe it was the day of the BN. Do you know about the BN? It's probably on Wikipedia. There was a big one in San Francisco and then we had a big one in New York. It was great. The show was a few hours long and there were continuous performances all day till about midnight, I believe. Murray the K introduced his big show band, which played some introductory themes. With dancers on stage, he had models, dancers, a big production. He thought he was great. Perhaps he still does. Murray Kaufman, Murray the K. Murray the K, let's see. Between acts, there was a silly fashion show. There were many groups, including the Shirelles, uh, maybe Jam and Dean, some sort of pop pap. Mitch Ryder and the Detroit Wheels were the headliner. And the show contained 10 or 15 minute sets by The Cream and The Who, who were both new bands then and they had never been seen in America until the Murray the K show in New York. So this is 1967. The Who had a 15 minute spot which they ended with My Generation. They did various songs in different shows. I saw two or three that day and came back on another day for a few more. I remember, I can't explain, Happy Jack, So Sad About Us, and uh, a few others. They were, I think they did The Kids Are All Right, I think that, and they did a quick one, their eight or nine minute mini opera, their first. They were magnificent. I couldn't believe it when the harmony voices came in during I Can't Explain. These two tall, aggressive guys on opposite sides of the stage both took a step forward to the mic at the same time and sang in perfect falsetto harmony. Whoa. Uh, they hadn't said anything during the whole show. They hadn't used their mics at all. And they came forward and... Uh, beautiful falsetto harmonies. Mm. Roger sent the microphone out on its wire. 20 feet, you know, like a cowboy and a lasso. 20 feet over the audience's head, yanking it back and jumping in the air to catch it in exact time for his next line. As the main singer, I would have expected him to do the talking between songs, 
Most fans had that and did that. But instead, Pete Townsend did all that. He did the talking, and Roger just did things like clearing his throat and getting ready for the next song. Keith Moon amazed us on the drums. Townsend adjusted the sound on his amplifier more than anyone I've ever seen before or since. Entwistle filled the hall with thunder. At the end of my generation, a visual display of destruction and chaos was played entirely on the bass. The guitar and drums were just crazy noise at that point because they were breaking the instruments. Keith tossed a tom-tom 20 feet into the air. Uh, glad it didn't come down and hit anybody in the band. Glad he didn't throw it out at the audience. Uh, Cream also had 15 minutes. They did I Feel Free, Crossroads, and another. I can't remember which. They were remarkable. Clapton often turned his back to the audience and was absorbed in his guitar. Baker took a long drum solo. They were kind of loud and fuzzy, but very intriguing. I would never have suspected that for 10 years after, almost every band I ever jammed with would try to play like the Cream. Everyone would try to solo constantly. People didn't try to play like Hendrix for those 10 years. It took Stevie Ray Vaughan and a few other people to get Hendrix back into everybody's head. I saw The Who again at the Village Theatre in 1969 in a hall which a year later became the Fillmore East. The Village Theatre was badly managed and when The Who, who had to make their way through the crowd to the stage and it was packed. When they went on, the microphones didn't all work. I'll never forget Townsend kicking over his mic stand in frustration. Wham! I mean, he took the microphone and kicked it near the bottom and it ran. He got fed up a few songs into the set and whispered to Roger, my generation. Roger looked puzzled, but he accepted it. They played that, smashed their stuff, and left to a roaring crowd. They had played about 20 minutes, and that was it. They got the heck out. I went to see them at the new Fillmore East, and it turned out to be the day Martin Luther King had been assassinated. Crowds of angry kids filled the streets. And Bill Graham decided to let people in without tickets to get them off the streets. Also, he knew that all the seats weren't sold, I'm sure. Consequently, the hall was extra crowded and the two shows were combined into one. The Who were playing when we got there. I mean, we got there before they should have gone on. We had tickets to the second show. Another band was supposed to be opening the show then, but the Who were on. They did a great show as usual, including the cigarette commercial that they had done that was never used, Little Billy. They did a nice long set. And then Buddy Guy tried to follow them. I mean... Buddy Guy, he was supposed to go on before them, but because the shows were messed up, he had to follow The Who. Uh, also, he wasn't as well known then as he is now. He did everything he could think of, including crawling down the aisles on his back while playing a solo. His long, I mean, a hundred feet, his long guitar chord 
being kept out of trouble by a dedicated assistant. But after his set, the crowd was unsatisfied. Bill Graham got on stage and harangued the crowd, saying we were spoiled kids, which we were. My wife, now my ex-wife, my wife from beside me yelled, what a deal! The crowd yelled in response, I cringed. We left as a general resignation was taking hold of the crowd. After all, the show was over. In the 60s, things happened like a group came to Bill Graham and said, the people want to have your place one day a week to do their thing. And he actually let them for a while. The 60s were quite interesting. The next time I saw them, it was again at the Fillmore East, two days after Tommy came out in America. I guess that's 1970. They warmed up with about 10 other songs, and then they did all of Tommy for us. I'll just tell, I'll tell you the most amazing thing I saw at the show. Keith Moon didn't have anything to play at the beginning of Tommy, because it was just a guitar solo intro. He wiggled about on his drum stool, chewing the scenery, restless. He suddenly stood up, turned sideways, and slowly fell into his drums, scattering them off the drum riser and hitting the riser on his shoulder. He immediately leapt back up to his feet, ran around the riser, and set his drums and cymbals back up. I believe a stagehand came out and helped him with the microphones. And he, put, uh, he did this at lightning speed, and when he was done, he ran back around to his spot, set up his stool, sat down, grabbed his sticks, lifted them over his head, and whacked both cymbals perfectly in time for his first cue. It was breathtaking. I couldn't believe it. And amazingly enough, there were 2,000 people there who saw it also. And I've never heard anyone refer to it. And, I, and no one took pictures of it. And as far as I know, if I didn't tell you, no one would ever tell anybody about this incredible incident. Yes, Keith Moon actually did that. Amazing. Keith Moon was amazing. The Who were amazing. I hope you enjoyed show 103. We have tried to use the cumulative knowledge we have gained from a hundred shows. Well, I didn't edit a hundred shows. I only edited about 50 or 60 of them. But I think it's closer to 60. It's been great. And unfortunately, as I get better and better at editing, it takes longer and longer because there are more and more things I know how to do. So, see you next week. I hope you have a wonderful week, or should I say, better than usual. You know, in old black and white TV, they had to wear blue shirts, or it would not look like they were wearing a white shirt. This is terrific. And now, I'm going to put my hands up like this. And at some point, I'll cut out of this scene.